Good oh, afternoon. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the symposium of the how to adopt the current guideline of the atrial fibrillation. I am Dr. Nguyen from the head of cardiology department, Yangon General Hospital, University of Medicine One. I'm chairing the, this section. And then the first section, the, the first section is uh, speaking by the talking about the overview of the atrial fibrillation, management of the atrial fibrillation. Yeah, the second uh, section is uh, talking by the discussing about the how to prevent the stroke in the atrial fibrillation by the Dr. Telesi. Now I'm going to start my talk here for the overview of the screen, overview of the management of the atrial fibrillation. Can you see my screen? These are the my outline, definition, classification of the atrial fibrillation, and then risk factors, pathophysiology, and clinical presentation of the atrial fibrillation, screening, diagnosis, and evaluation of the atrial fibrillation, integrated management, including the radiant rhythm control and the detection and management of the cardiovascular risk factors and concomitant diseases. These are my outline. So if you look at the definition of the atrial fibrillation in the AESC 2020 guideline, is the atrial fibrillation is the one of the supraventricular tachycardia with the uncoordinated atrial electrical activation and ineffective atrial contraction, ECG manifestation of the irregularly irregular RR intervals and absence of the distant repeating P wave and irregular atrial activation. So in 2020 guideline, ESE guideline, and the clinical atrial fibrillation is defined as a, at least the recorded atrial fibrillation is a minimum 30 seconds with or without symptoms. So what about the subclinical atrial fibrillation? Subclinical atrial fibrillation is the episode of the atrial fibrillation detected by the insoluble or wearable cardiac monitor, such as the CIED. CIED means a cardiac implantable electronic devices. So you can see here, this is the atrial fibrillation, the irregularly irregular ventricular contraction with the narrow complex tachycardia and rapid ventricular rate. So in ESC 2020 guideline, and the, atrial fibrillation, the pattern of the atrial fibrillation is classified as a first diagnosed atrial fibrillation, is the first time diagnosis irrespective of the duration and severity of the atrial fibrillation symptoms. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is defined as that it, it is dominated by or spontaneously or within with the intervention within the seven days. Persistent atrial fibrillation is the duration of the atrial fibrillation is the more, more than seven days. The episode is dominated by the cardioversion after the 70s. Long-standing atrial fibrillation, persistent atrial fibrillation is the continuous atrial fibrillation more than 12 months and still having to consider for the rhythm control strategy. The permanent atrial fibrillation is that there is a no further attempt for the restoration or the maintenance of the sinus rhythm. And the both physician and uh, patients accept the atrial fibrillation as a permanent atrial fibrillation. The 2020 ESE guideline does not use the terminology like the long atrial fibrillation, valvular, non fabula, and chronic atrial fibrillation. If you look at the risk factors of the atrial fibrillation, you can see here the inner ring is a risk factor of the atrial fibrillation. Those risks are the not modifiable. So genetic needs and gender and aging and then ethnicity are not, we cannot modify those, those risk factors. The outer ring, you can see here, there are many risk factors for the atrial fibrillation. Most of the cardio, cardiovascular diseases, heart failure, coronary artery disease, vascular diseases, valvular heart diseases, all the cardiovascular risk factors are the risk factors for the atrial fibrillation, also including the uh, obstructively apnea and the obesity, and also the major organ diseases like the COPD and the acute illness of this, acute illness surgery and chronic kidney disease. Those are the risk factors for the atrial fibrillation. So if you look at the pathophysiology of the atrial fibrillation, two main pathophysiological changes is a hypercoagulability and the, another thing is the structural remodeling, particularly in the atrial, atrial left atrial. The, the alteration as a result of the fibrosis, hypocontractility and inflammation, infiltration and vascular remodeling and ion channel dysfunction. These two pathophysiological changes are causing the thromboembolism and heart failure with the preserved or reduced LVEF. And then clinical outcomes are the, the stroke and then 
consequences of the genetic impairment, dementia, depression, and impaired, finally impaired the quality of the life and hospitalization, and finally ends up with the mortality. These are the clinical outcomes. So if you look at the symptoms of the clinical presentation of the atrial fibrillation, some patients, they do not have the, any symptoms, but they are very stable with the hemodynamic. And then some patients, with the, even though the symptoms make it, they are stable, hemodynamically stable, like the people usually present with the perturbation, dyspnea, and, and tightness of chest, and sometimes and dizziness. And some patients, and then they have the hemodynamically unstable, and then they usually present with the syncope and the symptomatic hypotension, acute heart failure, pulmonary edema, and ongoing myocardial ischemia, and finally cardiogenic shock. So if you look at the 2020 ESC guideline and then screening of the atrial fibrillation, emphasize the screening of the atrial fibrillation because uh, there are many novel tools for the atrial fibrillation detectable devices like the smart, uh, smartphone and the wearable watch and the touchable mid devices. These are the very uh, useful for the detection of the atrial fibrillation. So the recommendation of the screening to the detection of the atrial fibrillation and ESC 2020 is a class one recommendation. For example, the patient atrial fibrillation is detected by the patient of the pass of the ECG written switch by the any device after the age of the 65 year or interrogation of the CIED by the detection of the atrial high rate episode and the detection of the atrial fibrillation. These are the class one indication. For the class 2A indication is the patient with the 75 years of age or the patient with the high risk of the atrial fibrillation using the systematic ECG screening to detect the atrial fibrillation is the class 2A recommendation. The patient with the atrial fibrillation, how to assess the patient with the atrial fibrillation is that you can see here, uh, you should remember the four S. The first S is the stroke, stroke risk and how to calculate the stroke risk and by using the chest first school. This area will be talking by the Dr. Teles VA. And then second thing is the symptom severity and then how to assess the symptom severity. And then we can use the, for example, the EHRA symptom scoring system. The third one is the severity of the AF version. The AF version is the duration of the AF and also the density of the atrial fibrillation. And then using the special uh, report to the cardiologist or physician and using the 24-hour photo monitoring is the, sim sim um, the simplest way to the detection of the severity of the atrial fibrillation version. The, the, the final one is the substrate severity. Substrate severity and the detection and identification of the cardiovascular risk factor as well as for the comorbidity. And then atrial, another thing is the atrial cardiomyopathy. Atrial detection of the atrial cardiomyopathy by using the imaging like the transthoracic echo and transesophageal echo or CT. For, uh, CT angiogram, CT angiogram, and then but you can using the biomarkers for the detection of the left atrial for cardiomyopathy. So for the basic knowledge of the these four S, and then all the atrial fibrillation patient, and then medical history should include the AF related symptoms, and then AF pattern, and then con the, um, and you can find out the concomitant disease, concomitant condition. And then also calculate the chest vascular for the prevention of the stroke. And then all the patients should have the 12 ECG and then basic investigation, electrolytes and full blood count, also including the thyroid and kidney function. The trans if available, transthoracic echocardiography is a very useful to assessment of the patient with atrial fibrillation. And some patients, and then you need to refer to the cardiologist or physician for the further assessment. And then selected patients should need the should, should be need to needed to be the further investigation, like the ambulatory ECG monitoring. The simplest way is a 24-hour photo monitoring for the adequacy of the rate control or the rate if if population related symptoms. The trans is always a Echocardiography is also determined determine the valvular heart, valvular heart disease and then left atrial appendix thrombosis. And then also the, the clinical biochemical bio, 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 parameters, bio, bio, parameters like the cardiac troponin, HSCRP, and then BMP and then pro BMP are also useful. And then cognitive function assessment is also need to be in the patient with the atrial fibrillation. For the assessment of the coronary artery disease, CT coronary angiogram and the ischemic imaging are very useful. And then CT and MRI for the using for the detection of the stroke patient and then cardiac MRI for the using, using for the early assessment. 
for the after the assessment and the whole con the select uh, the structural follow up is very important because the structural follow up is uh, to make sure the optimal management adherence of the optimal management with the patient. And that done in the cardiologist physician and coordination between the cardiologist physician and primary care physicians are very important for the structure follow up. So this is an example of the EHRA symptom scale and they're very similar to the NYH8 class and also based on the daily normal daily activity. So what about the components of the integrated AF management? A integrated AF management is the patient center integrated patient AF management. Then these are the three important components. The, the one is the, the first one is the optimize the stroke prevention. The second is the symptom control by the either rate or rhythm control. And the third one is the management of the cardiovascular risk factors and comorbidity. To achievement of the, this uh, integrated AF management, and then we need to educate the patient for the risk factor control. Also need to get, educate for the healthcare providers for the how to do the structure follow up. So there's all these strategies are to promote the adherence, medication adherence for the patient. So the multidisciplinary uh, approach is uh, very important. And then structural follow up between the clear communication between the primary and secondary care physician are very important for the optimal management of the patient with atrial fibrillation. So the 2020 ESC guideline mentioned about the CC to ABC. What is the CC to ABC? Is that confirm the atrial fibrillation? Characterize the atrial fibrillation by the assessment of the atrial fibrillation using the 4S, you should remember. And then the, the treatment of the atrial fibrillation is the ABC pathway. ABC pathway includes the first A, A for the anticoagulation treatment avoid the stroke, and B for the better control of the symptoms by the either using the rate con control strategy or rhythm control strategy. The C, C1, C is the identification of the comorbidity and the management of the cardiovascular risk, by identification and management of the cardiovascular risk factor. So here is, the, I just want to show you that how to, uh, uh, how to use for the rate control, rate control therapy. Rate control therapy is the background therapy in the, all the AF patients. The first choice therapy in the patient with the minor symptoms and also the after the failure of the rhythm control strategy is that you can use for the rate control strategy. Sometimes and the rate control strategy is useful when the risk of the restoring the sinus rhythm is the outweigh the benefit of the benefit and the initial rate control is the linear rate control is the initial rate control is the heart rate less than one, 110 pp. Uh, feet per minute, and then if if patient has the stage symptomatic or the deterioration of the LV function, uh, a patient with the CRT cardiac resynchronization therapy doesn't work doesn't work for the patient, and then we need to bring down the heart rate to the ATP per minute, and then lower uh, the CR heart rate in the CRT aiming at the biventricular pacing and patient during the exercise. The, 25% of the exercise, the minimum heart rate should bring down to the 100 feet per minute. So how to achieve the dead one? And then we can use for the 24-hour hotel monitoring for the CT. If the, you cannot achieve the rate, con rate control the, uh, achievement, and then you should consider for the rhythm control or the or for the patient with the CRT, we should need to consider for the if we look ablation. So this is a simple, a simple algorithm for the rate control strategy, initial rate control strategy. So you, the, the basic is that you need to know that patient have the sign and symptoms of the clinical heart failure or the patient have the reduced LVEF. If you don't have the uh, feasibility of the echocardiogram, it doesn't matter. And we need to use the, the chest X-ray to patient have the uh, LV failure or not. If the patient doesn't have the LV failure, you can use the Peter blocker or the delta sign of the rapamide and the gelsen channel blocker for the rate control approach. And if the initial target heart rate is not achieved, and you can act for the development. If the patient with the heart failure, you can start with the beta, low dose beta blocker. If patient cannot tolerate the beta blocker, you can use for the immunodrome for the initial rate control. If the patient is not achieving the target heart rate, you can act for the development. The important thing is that try to avoid the bradycardia and after the rate control and then you can you should arrange for the echocardiogram for the assessment of the chest vascular for the further plan for the further management. So these are the drugs using in the drug for the rate control. So I'm going to talk about the 
return control approach. And return control approach is that the, a, the main strategy for the return control is to reduce the AF related symptoms and improve the quality of the life. Before starting the return control strategy, you need to make sure that there's a stroke prevention should be confirmed. And then rate control is the, uh, the optimal rate control and the and detection of the cardiovascular risk factor and detection of the comorbidity should be uh, performed perfectly. So after that, the patient still having the symptoms. You need to expect that these those symptoms are the AF-related symptoms or not. And the important thing in how to assess the AF-related symptom. So the if you cannot do for that one, and the refer to the physician or the refer to the cardio cardiologist. The, who are the benefits from the rhythm control approach? A patient with the young age, at the first episode of the atrial fibrillation, those patients with the atrial fibrillation induced tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, the patient with the early initial state of the early remodeling, and the patient with the minor co comorbidity with the normal structural heart disease and very difficult to achieve the target rate control. And these are the potential candidates for the rhythm control strategy. So if we have the rhythm control and then how we do the rhythm control, we have the two approach and then using the antiarrhythmic thrust or the ablation. So initial approach to the rhythm control is that we need to consider for the cardioversion. So consideration of the cardioversion is that basically for the two, basic on the how stable patient is it. So if the patient is an emergency situation, we don't need to consider for the, the, the other things and then just give the anticoagulation and then do the electrical cardioversion. If the patient is a hemodynamically stable, you need to check the oral anticoagulation status of the patient. And then also need to check for the duration of the atrial fibrillation, how long for the duration, how long has been for the atrial fibrillation, less than 12 hours or more, in between 12 to 48 hours or more than 48 hours. After assessment of the those factors, you need to consider for the early cardiovascular with the either pharmacological or the electrical delay cardiovascular or the elective cardiovascular and using the OAC status. So after the maintenance of the sinus rhythm, at least a four weeks for the anticoagulation must be given. After that, and then you have to assess for the chest bus score for the long term consideration of the long term anticoagulation. These are the antiarrhythmic drugs. So indication for the long term rhythm control strategy is that just to relieve the symptoms. So before starting the long term and the uh, uh, rhythm control strategy, you need to assess for the how much the patient has the structural, dis, uh, uh, structural damage in the heart. And then also the optimization of the cardiovascular risk factor control and then optimization of the treatment of the comorbidity. So patients without structural heart disease, you can use the donor drug, flaconide and propofenol and sotalol. The alternative is the capital ablation. In Myanmar, and also we have available drugs are the flaconide, propofenol and sotalol. The patient with the coronary artery disease or preserved heart failure with the preserved LVEF, the significant valvular heart disease, and then you can use for the immutron, donor drone, and sotalol. The alternative is the capital ablation. Patient with the reduced LVEF, the only drug is the immutron. So if we look at the catheter ablation, what are the class one indication for the catheter ablation is the patient with the paroxysm or persistent atrial fibrillation with the recurrence heart failure due to the atrial fibrillation, we should consider either antiarrhythmic drugs or the catheter ablation with the recommendation of the class one recommendation. If you use the antiarrhythmic drug and then pay for the antiarrhythmic drug and then you should consider for the perform the catheter ablation is the class two A indication. Another class one indication is the patient with the persistent atrial fibrillation without major factors for the atrial fibrillation recurrences. Phase medical therapy, you should consider for the catheter ablation as the first line therapy. So, what are the factors and to poor outcome for the rhythm control strategy? So, these are the factors the cardio, major cardiovascular risk factor, hypertension, glycemic control and smoking, hypercholesterolemia, and OSA, and physical inactivity, alcohol, using of the alcohol. So optimization of the comprehensive AS risk factor management is very important to optimize the outcome of the patient with the, either the rhythm control, uh, rhythm control strategy, the support of the rhythm control strategy or the AIDS catheter ablation. 
So important thing is that you control the optimization of the cardiovascular risk factor control is very important. So this is a, my final slide of all going to the summary. And you can see here, the, uh, the aim for the management of the atrial fibrillation is the reduction of the mortality and morbidity. The primary prevention of the atrial fibrillation is the lifestyle modification. That means the cardiovascular risk factor management and risk factor for the atrial fibrillation management and then treatment of the underlying condition. So these are the primary prevention. For the secondary prevention, addition to that, and the secondary prevention is a stroke prevention, the symptom control by the either rate control or rhythm control, and then comorbidity control with the, the comorbidity and the cardiovascular risk factors. Yeah, then for, this is for the secondary. So you can see the middle, middle box, middle box as a atrial fibrillation risk factor. You can see here that some are modifiable, some are not modifiable, and some are the partially modifiable. For example, the, the concomitant diseases like the heart failure, COPD, and valvular heart disease and coronary artery disease, those are the partially modification, can do the partial modification. Aging and gen genetics and uh, gender cannot do with the modification. Uh, and you, if you look at the LA remodeling, and re LA remodeling in the early LA remodeling is a reversible condition like the electrical, biochemical, and implantation state. And then late stage of the LA, LA remodeling is a non-reversible, for example, the fibrosis, scarring, and dil dilatation. Based on that, these early remodeling, the pattern of the atrial fibrillation is paroxysmal, persistent, or permanent atrial fibrillation. The final outcome of the clinical outcome of the atrial fibrillation is the mortality, stroke, and dementia, impaired quality of life, heart failure, myocardial infarction, hospitalization, and finally for their burden on their healthcare costs. So I'm going to summarize my presentation here. The diagnosis of the atrial fibrillation needs to be confirmed by the conventional 20 ECG or the written strip showing the atrial fibrillation duration equal or more than 30 seconds. There are the many novel tools for the screening and detection of the atrial fibrillation substantially add to the diagnostic opportunity. The structural characterization of the AF, that means the assessment of the atrial fibrillation, you, can rem you should remember the 4S to improve their personalized treatment. Integrated holistic management of the atrial fibrillation is the essential to improve the outcome. The ABC pathway streamlines the integrated care of the atrial fibrillation across the healthcare levels and among the different specialties. Rate control is an integral part of the atrial fibrillation management is that it's often sufficient to improve the AF-related symptoms. The primary indications for the rhythm control using the cardioversion in antiarrhythmic drugs and or catheter ablation is the reduction of the AF-related symptoms and improvement of the quality of the life. To initiate the long-term antiarrhythmic drug needs to be balanced between the symptom burden and the possible adverse effect drug reaction, particularly drugs induced pro-arrhythmic arrhythmia or extracardiac side effect and the patient preference. Catheter ablation is a well-established treatment for the prevention of the atrial fibrillation recurrences and alternative to the atrial antiarrhythmic drug. Identification of the and, and management of the risk factors and concomitant diseases is the integral part of the treatment of the atrial fibrillation. Thank you for your kind attention. So I'm stop here for the, my presentation. I would like to introduce the second speaker. Second speaker is the AP, Associate Professor Dr. Telesvei. Dr. Telesvei is the Senior Consultant Cardiologist Uni, uh, Cardiology Department, Yangon General Hospital, University of Medicine One, and then she is working together with me. And then she is uh, also specializing in electrophysiology and cardiac pacing. And then she was also trained in the National Heart Center Singapore for one for the cardiac electrophysiology and pacing. And then she is uh, also the graduated from the. University of Medicine one, also finished the well trained in the internal medicine and finished the master degree in the internal medicine, also member of the Royal College of the Physician of the Fellow of the Royal College of the Physician. She finished the cardiology doctorate in the 20, 2015 and then also joined the training in the cardiology, also in the cardio, cardio electrophysiology and pacing. And now she is still practicing with us, me for the cardio cardiac electrophysiology and pacing. Without further introduction, I would like to uh, inter um, call the Dr. Telesvei for presenting about the approach, uh, current approach for the stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. Dr. Telesvei, please. Uh, thank you very much, Romanwe, uh, for your kind introduction. 
I'm really honored to be a speaker in this 67th MME conference. Today, I'm speaking about the current approach for the stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. But the key topics I will be talking about is the 4SAL scheme and the integrated ABC pathway, the stroke risk assessment, bleeding risk assessment, stroke prevention therapies and recommendations, how to deal with the anticoagulation for AF in the acute coronary syndrome, chronic coronary syndrome, and for the patients who underwent the percutaneous coronary intervention, and stroke prevention for the recurrent attacks in the AF patients. Uh, this is the 4SAF scheme that the previous presenter have already talked about. The first one is the stroke risk assessment. It is very important and it is, it is usually done by the chart bus go. This is the components of the integrated AF management. In the integrated AF management, the patient is the center of the treatment. So it should be the patient center care and patients should be explained about the diagnosis and the treatment options and the progress about the disease and the outcome of the treatment. So firstly, the optimized stroke prevention is very important because stroke is very disabling and patient with the stroke can have a unproductive life. And the other symptom control for the rate and the rhythm are already explained by the previous speaker. This is the integrated ABC pathway for the management of stroke. Now, now in the 2020 ESC guideline, it is stressed about the CC to ABC approach. Firstly, confirm the AF and, the, and then characterize the AF by the 4S AF scheme and the ABC pathway, A for the anticoagulation of white stroke, B for the better symptom control and C for the treatment of the comorbidities and the cardiovascular risk factor management. For the A, this is about the anticoagulation and how to avoid stroke. Firstly, we identify the low risk patients by the chart bar score. Who are the low risk? Chart bar score zero for men and one for women are usually in the low risk group. And we should offer the stroke prevention treatment if the chart bar score is more than or equal to one in male and more than two in female. And we should assess the bleeding risk, address the modifiable bleeding risk factors in those who will be on the anticoagulation treatment. And, and then followed by the choosing oral anticoagulation based anticoagulants, whether no egg or do egg, or whether the vitamin K antagonist with the well-managed GTR. So firstly, we should assess the stroke risk. Usually, uh, there are so many stroke risk factors in patients with AF. So most commonly studied clinical risk factors, these are usually included in the chart bar score. And the other clinical risk factors also include the impaired renal function, obstructive sleep apnea, hokum, hyperlipidemia, smoking, metabolic syndrome, and malignancy. But the most commonly studied clinical risk factors are included in the chart bar score. Here is the chart bar score. A C for the congestive heart failure. So is the patient having clinical heart failure or objective evidence of moderate to severe LV dysfunction or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If there is one, we will, uh, the patient will have one point. If the patient present with the decompensated heart failure, irrespective of the LVEF, that means heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with the preserved ejection fraction will be included in this category. And another one is H is for the hypertension or if the patient is on the antihypertensive therapy, and age is the continuous risk factor for the stroke and age more than 75 years and above will have two points. And another one is D is for the diabetes mellitus, whether the patient is treating, uh, having treatment with the oral hypoglycemic agents or insulin or having blood glucose of 
fasting glucose of more than 125 mg per deciliter. If the patient has previous stroke, TIA or the thromboembolism, there will be two points for the score. And if the patient has the vascular disease like a uh, coronary artery disease, previous myocardial infarction, peripheral arterial disease, or the aortic plug, the score will be added. And if the patient is within the age of 65 to 74 years, there will be one point. And if the patient is female, the, uh, the patient will have one point. But female is the female uh, category is not the risk factor, but is a risk modifier in the child bar score. So there is an association between the child bar score and adjusted stroke risk. If the patient has one, one point in the child bar score, he or she has the 1.3% per year of adjusted stroke risk. If the patient is having more and more score, the risk will be more and more higher. So after assessing the child bar score, we will need to assess the bleeding risk. There are so many uh, scores for assessing the bleeding risk, but we usually use the HES blood score. Age for the uncontrolled hypertension when the systolic blood pressure is more than 160. We will need to look for whether the patient has the renal or hepatic dysfunction, whether the patient is undergoing dialysis or transplant, or the serum creatinine is more than 200 micromole per liter, or the liver impairment with the cirrhosis, with the bilirubin two times upper limit normal, and the enzymes three times upper limit of normal. Whether the patient is previous stroke or bleeding history or predisposing to the previous uh, bleeding, bleeding history and lay by INR, that is when the patient is taking the vitamin K antagonist like warfarin, when the time in therapeutic range is less than 60%, it will score one point. And the, if the patient is in the elderly, it will add to the score. And we, we should need to, uh, we should ask the patient about the drugs or the excessive alcohol drinking history because the concomitant use of antiplatelet or NSAIDs and excessive alcohol, 14 units per week, will add one point for the HES blood score. So the maximum score in the HES blood will be nine, and HES blood score of zero to two is regarded as the low risk of bleeding. In the assessment of the HES blood score, we should look for the non-modifiable and modifiable scores. These are the non-modifiable scores like age more than 65 years, previous major bleeding, hepatic dysfunction, genetic factors, uh, being a diabetic, being having a cognitive impairment or dementia. These are the non-modifiable scores in the HES blood, HES blood score. But there are potentially modifiable and modifiable scores that I have uh, mentioned in this table. So one thing is that we should assess for the modifiable bleeding risk factors and we, we, we need to correct correct the bleeding risk factor. For example, if the patient is having elevated blood pressure and the one blood pressure is controlled well by the antihypertensive, the score will be deducted one point. If the patient is having excessive alcohol intake, uh, we should educate the patient to refrain alcohol. So there will be reduction in one point in the HES blood score. So that HES blood score will be lower than the previous episode. And then patient will have the less chance of bleeding. So these are the absolute uh, contraindications to the oral anticoagulants. When the patient is having the active serious bleeding, the source should be identified and treated first. And when the patient is having the associated comorbidities like severe thrombocytopenia, severe anemia, which is still under investigation, and recently high risk of bleeding events like intracranial hemorrhage, these are the absolute indications for oral anticoagulation. Although the patient may have indication for the anticoagulation treatment, according to the child bar score. So what are we doing in the clinical practice? When the patient is eligible for the oral anticoagulation, we should identify the risk by the child bar score. This is step one. With the child bar score, we, we can identify the low risk patient and the high risk patient. If the, what is the low risk? Low risk means child bar score is zero in men and one in women. So this is the low risk. If the patient is in low risk, we should not give antithrombotic treatment like no egg or warfarin. If the patient is not in the low risk, that is when the child bar score is more than one in male or more than two in female, we should look for the HES blood score. When the HES blood score is more than or three, that is having the high bleeding risk, we should address for the modifiable bleeding risk factors that I have mentioned before, 
and the flag up the patient for the regular review and follow up. We should ask the patient to attend regular and uh, early follow up to calculate the head stress score again, and we should assess the bleeding risk. After doing all these risk goals and uh, informing the patient about the diagnosis and the treatment options, if the chart bar score is more than one in male and more than two in female, the oral anticoagulation treatment should be considered. This is the class 2A indication. When the chart bar score is more than or equal to two in male and more than or equal to three in female, oral anticoagulation is recommended. This is highly recommended, class 1A indication. So in the patients with the class 1A indication and in the patients with the class 2A indication, we, we can begin the NOAC, that is newer or anticoagulant, anticoagulants, and we can also call them the DOEX, direct oral anticoagulants, or vitamin K with the uh, INR in the high, high time in the therapeutic range. And nowadays, the NOACs are generally recommended as the first line therapy for the oral anticoagulation. So what will we choose? The uh, NOAC or DOAC or the vitamin K antagonist, the warfarin. So after being assessed uh, the chart bar score and the HES plus score, patients should be explained about the diagnosis and the treatment options. In our country, the patients are not financially sound so that the new anticoagulants like uh, rivaroxaban or epicerbin, they cannot afford. It might cost a fortune for them so that they can be uh, discussed about taking warfarin. So in taking the warfarin, patients should be uh, assessing very frequently at the outpatient clinic at the initial part. And then maybe later on, they may attend the clinic maybe every month or maybe every six weekly to assess the INR. So if, if the clinician is uh, having a dilemma about uh, uh, giving warfarin or the no egg, the same TTR score can also be used. If the vitamin K antagonist is being considered, we can calculate the same TTR score with this score. And the score is 0 to 2, we can consider the vitamin K or the NOAC. But the, if the score is more than 2, it is less likely that patient is having uh, less likely to achieve a good time and therapeutic range on the warfarin. So we should advise patient to have the NOAC. The better point of the NOAC is that the patient does not need to come to the clinic very frequently for adjusting the dosage. So if the patient is living in a remote area like a northern uh, Kachin state or the, uh, very much in the southern part of the country, uh, if they cannot come to the uh, clinic very frequently, they can be on the NOAC if they can afford the medication. If the warfarin is used, the, the time in therapeutic range should be ideally more than 70%. So they should have a, a therapeutic INR in the therapeutic range for most of the time in the patients with uh, warfarin. So what are the stroke prevention therapies? The vitamin K antagonists and non-vitamin K antagonists like dabigatran, epizabin, rivaroxaban, and endoxaban. In our country, we can have the rivaroxaban and epizabin, and we can uh, we can see some patients on the dabigatran who have been coming back from abroad for the AF management. And other antithrombotic drugs like antiplatelets have uh, literally no role in the prevention of stroke in atrial fibrillation. Here's just to memorize the mechanism of action of anticoagulant therapy. Uh, these are the direct factor 10A inhibitors, the epizabin, endoxabin, and rivaroxabin, and the dabigatran acts on the factor 2A, and the warfarin acts on the factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. So what is the difference between the NOX versus vitamin K? They have comparable benefits, but the according to the RCTs, NOX have a 19% reduction in the risk of stroke or systemic embolism, 51% reduction in hemorrhagic stroke, 10% reduction in all cause mortality. Uh, it seems good. And non-significant 14% reduction in the major bleeding risk, and they have 25% increase in the GI bleeding. So NOX have a risk, higher risk of GI bleeding. This is the dose selection criteria for AF. In our country, we have uh, rivaroxabin and epizabin. So rivaroxabin standard dose is about 20 milligram OD and the reduced dose is about 15 milligram per day. And the uh, indication for the reduction of the dose is the creatinine clearance. 
and the ab seven is in the dose of five milligram PD, and the dose should be reduced if the if the patient is elderly, more than or equal to eighty year body weight is less than or equal to sixty, and the serum creatinine is high. Dabigatran, the standard dose is one fifty milligram per PD, and lower dose is one ten milligram PD, and the Dabigatran dose should be reduced in the elderly patient and patient with the concomitant use of verapamil and the increase in the bleeding risk. So what is the recommendation for prevention of thromboembolic events in AF? So no eggs are usually recommended. This is the class 1A. If the child pass goal is zero in men, one in women, not offer antithrombotic. Child pass goal more than two in men, more than three in women, oral anticoagulant is highly recommended. This is the class 1A. So if the child pass score is one in men, two in women, you can give anti oral, oral anticoagulant, but the uh, recommendation is less. This is 2A recommendation. And the risk score based bleeding risk assessment should be used at all time. Uh, the HES plus score should be used for the bleeding risk. If the HES plus score is more than three, there is the high risk of bleeding and patients should be ask for the frequent clinical review and follow-up and we should find out the modifiable bleeding risk factor and correct as much as possible and the stroke and bleeding risk assessment at the periodic intervals should be done and the patient with AF with the low risk of stroke first assessment of the stroke risk at four to six months after the index evaluation that is the class 2a indication because you may be assessing a patient with the uh, age of something like 74 over 74, something 74.5 years, maybe in the six months time, he, will, he or she will be 75 and the risk will be added one score. That is why the index, after index evaluation, you should assess the risk again at four to six months interval at clinic visits. If the vitamin K is used, the INR should be two to three and time in therapeutic range should be more than or equal to 70%. And here are the points that I would like to highlight. What about the adiblalet therapy? We cannot afford no X. Uh, we cannot do the uh, regular follow-up and check up of the protomin time or INR with the warfarin. Can we give adiblalet as a successful prevention of the stroke? No, this is not recommended. This is class three. So when we assess the bleeding risk, bleeding risk is high. Is it a contraindication to the anticoagulation? So estimated bleeding risk should not in itself guide the treatment decision to use the oral anticoagulant. So clinical condition of the patient should not condition the indication of the thromboprophylaxis as well. These are the class three. So this is, should be avoided. What about the AF patients having the acute coronary syndrome and having the PCI? Uh, in, this, in this figure, it is clearly pointed out that when the patient is having acute coronary syndrome, that is acute ST elevation MI, when the patient is undergoing the PCI. Uh, in the first phase, we can give aspirin for the one month, p 2 y drop in a beta, that is a preferable equobidograph for 12 months, and the no egg. Initial one month, we have a two and the platelet plus one no egg. And the p 2 y drop in a beta should continue to 12 months. And then after 12 months, that is one year, we can stop clopidogrel and then give the no egg for the long term. And in the patient undergoing the PCI in the chronic coronary syndrome, like a, a chronic uh, coronary artery diseases, after doing the PCI, we should give aspirin for the one month, uh, P2I drop inhibitor, that is clopidogrel, preferably clopidogrel for six months. And if the patient has low bleeding risk, but the patient has having high risk of stent thrombosis, we can extend to one year. And after one year, both the anti will be stopped and then we can continue the no egg. So, sorry. The bleeding risk and the thrombotic risk usually assessed, should be assessed by the, the cardiologist who is uh, performing the PCI and the plan for the duration of the antithrombotic therapy. So these are the recommendations for the patients with AF acute coronary syndrome who are undergoing primary PCI and the chronic coronary syndrome who are going the PCI.
So no eggs are in preference to the vitamin K antagonist. If the risk of thrombosis is very low, and if the bleeding risk is very high, higher than the risk of stem thrombosis, we can stop the aspirin in less than or one week duration. In the previous figure, it, is, it was shown that the aspirin should be given for one month. If the bleeding risk is very high, we can stop the aspirin in less than one week. This is the class one indication as well. Also in the chronic coronary syndrome, we can stop aspirin in less than one week duration, but continue clopidogrel for up to 12 months in the ACS, up to six months in the chronic coronary syndrome. And after that, the clopidogrel is stopped and the ONOAC should be continued. What about AF patients with acute ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke? Usually the AF related strokes are fatal and disabling and there can be early recurrences and there can be hemorrhagic transformation. And when they have the hemorrhagic transformation and ICH, there can be higher morbidity and mortality. So what about the timing of uh, oral anticoagulation at the acute ischemic stroke? The high quality RCTs are still lacking. The, uh, the opinions are still based on the expert consensus. In the previous guideline, it is recommended that the patient is having TIA. The anticoagulation can be start one day after the acute event. If the patient is having the mild stroke with the low NIHHS score, the anticoagulation can be started three days after the event. And if the patient has moderate stroke and the severe stroke, the patient should undergo recheck CT or MRI for the microbleeds, and then can be uh, oral anticoagulation can be started either six days after the acute event or 12 days after the acute event. This is the recommendation according to the AHA acute stroke ASA guideline for the management of patient with acute stroke with the AF. So oral anticoagulation can usually be started, restarted between four and 14 days after the onset of the neurological symptoms. This is the class 2 A B recommendation. What about the long-term secondary stroke prevention? Shall we add aspirin to the OAC? No. Shall we, uh, uh, shall we give warfarin with the supratherapeutic INR, that is INR more than three? No, there is no evidence of to improve the outcome. In the case of the anticoagulation, who have the better efficacy in secondary stroke prevention and better safety regarding the ICH. And the good ad adherence to the OAC should be uh, recommended at all times. What about reinitiation of anticoagulation in post intracranial bleeding? Uh, we can assess the risk of recurrent ICH and we have to address the modifiable bleeding risk factor. We need to weigh the risk and benefit of restarting reinstitution of the OAC. If there is less risk of reinstitution of the OAC, we can restart the oral anticoagulation two to four weeks after the ICH. If there is risk, we can uh, offer the left atria appendage occlusion to avoid the previous stroke in case of ICH and the AF, or we can choose no therapy, no stroke prevention therapy, according to the patient uh, risk of having the recurrent stroke and risk of having fatal intracranial hemorrhage. So in, the, in patients with the uh, oral anticoagulation, this is how to manage the bleeding complication. So when there is bleeding, compress the bleeding site, and then we should check the hemodynamic status, BP, coagulation parameters, blood count, kidney function. What anticoagulant is the patient is taking? Vitamin K antagonist, is it minor bleeding? And then we can give the, we can stop the warfarin for a while to let the INR go down below two. If moderate to severe, we can give the fluid replacement and then vitamin K injection. Severe and life-threatening bleeding should be treated with the thrombin complex concentrate of FFP. In the NOAC patients as well, if the minor bleeding, NOAC should be uh, stopped only for one day. If moderate bleeding, uh, should consider to add the oral charcoal if the NOAC is recently ingested less than 24 hour duration. In the severe life threatening condition, we can give prothrombin uh, PCC or the FFP if available. So here are my key messages. So the, for the structural clinical risk goal based assessment of the individual thromboembolic risk, we use the chart vasco as the first step. Uh, 
And then in the patient with AF and risk factor for stroke need to be treated with oral anticoagulant for the stroke prevention. Uh, in NOAC eligible patients, NOAC are preferred over vitamin K antagonists. And we should assess the bleeding risk score by the HES blood score. And we should address the modifiable bleeding risk factor at all time. And we should manage the modifiable bleeding risk factor so that patients uh, have low bleeding risk. And in the patient with the acute coronary syndrome undergoing the uncomplicated PCI, early discontinuation of aspirin and switch to dural antithrombotic therapy with the OAC and the P2-hydrof inhibitor, that is clopidogrel, should be considered. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Leslie, for your informative presentation. So we have the only, the time constraint is that we have only five minutes left. And then I will, we have the many uh, questions for the, from the audience. So the first question is, the, how do we consider for the persistent AF for the rhythm control approach in the, apart from the symptom? So this one is, a, I, I should answer as a, because of the, for the utilization of the rhythm, either rhythm control or choosing of the rhythm control or rate control is that depends on the many factors. So initial state, and we start with the rate control. After that, and I already talking about the, who are the benefit from the rhythm control, who are the benefit from the rhythm control. So in the case of the persistent AF, patient doesn't have the, any stru structural heart disease. Duration of the AF is a shorter. And the structural the heart disease means the left atrial data is very important. So you should choose for the above from the, if the patient is a favorable condition, patient doesn't have the many symptoms related to the AF, you try to choose for the, uh, try to choose for the rhythm control approach. If they, and then you follow with the rate control. So finally, the most of the cases at, at that time, and you need to look at the, how, how many comorbidities and then how, uh, how severe the cardiovascular risk is a very important. So this is my question, answer. Another question is uh, how to use for the patient with the not tolerate for the rhythm, uh, rate control in the fetal blocker. You can use for the immune This is the answer. So another question is uh, for the Dr. Telesvi. Uh, when they are going to re resume for the OAC, uh, like the new egg for the after the intracranial hemorrhage? I think uh, you already presented in the your presentation. Yes. So anyway, you can answer yes. for that. Uh, after having the intracranial hemorrhage, you can resume the OAC after two to four weeks of having intracranial hemorrhage, but you have to weigh the benefits of uh, preventing further ischemic stroke and uh, the risk of having another ischemic, uh, sorry, another intracranial hemorrhage. And you should address the other bleeding risk factor and try to lessen the bleeding risk factor as well. So the last question is uh, the success rate of the catheter ablation. They're asking about the success rate of the catheter ablation in the atrial fibrillation. The success rate of the catheter ablation is that uh, I already showed that what are the poor outcome in the catheter ablation. If the, your patient is a very severe cardiovascular risk factor, many, too many cardiovascular risk factor, too many, and associated with the comorbidity. So that is why the outcome is very poor. If the, your selection is very good, and then the, the outcome, the success rate is a very high, higher. So it depends on the center and the experience of the person also. So uh, this is an ND for the electrophysiology, and then the, the, the mechan how to apply for the mechanism for the, just for the pulmonary vein isolation or the target for the, the, all the signal from the, wherever the signal, and then you go to, going to apply is another way. So these are the many, uh, so, technical approach for the AF ablation. So and the only the important thing is the selection of the patient is a very important. And then we, and in the, our Young General Hospital, we have the, not the much experience, and then we highly selected the patient and then for the success, uh, higher the success outcome and then to prevent the complication. So now in the time is uh, only one minute left. So we would like to conclude that this section and also thanks to the, uh, the 67 in my medical conference so having us allowed to the present uh, and having us for the having uh, allowed us for the presenting the atrial fibrillation topic here and then also thanks to the fighter biotech for the sponsoring the, this section
then also thanks to the all the participation for all the participants for attendees for the active participation asking that too many questions i have answered the, some questions by the with the message okay anyway thank you very much for the all the thank you very much for all of you and also have a nice evening thank you bye bye